Hello, everyone. Welcome to um, our talk on building and managing a centralized machine learning platform with Cookflow at CERN. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, some work we've been doing in the last few months and uh, a service that we open to our users. Um, hello, my name is Dan Glovich. I am a computing engineer in CERN Cloud team. Uh, my focus is on machine learning infrastructure services with Kubernetes, and I will present this talk with my colleague Ricardo. My name is Ricardo. Um, I'm a computing engineer also in the CERN Cloud team. I focus mostly on containers, networking, and more recently, GPUs, accelerators, and also machine learning. And I'm also a member of the technical oversight committee of the CNCF as an end user representative. So today we'll, we'll give a talk about uh, service at CERN, but uh, just a very quick overview uh, of what CERN is about. So CERN is the European Laboratory for Particle Physics, the largest particle physics laboratory in the world. And we build like large scientific machines that allow us to do fundamental research. Um, the largest we have is the Large Hadron Collider. You probably heard of it. It's a 27 kilometer uh, perimeter particle accelerator that is 100 meters in the ground and where we accelerate two beams of protons to very close to the speed of light. And we make them collide at very specific points where we build uh, large experiments. And you see here CMS, LHCB, Atlas, and ALICE. To have an idea of the size, uh, you can see the Geneva airport here on the picture. Uh, this is uh, an image of the accelerator itself in the tunnel. And you can see all the magnets that help us beam the, uh, uh, bend the beam so that it circulates in the, in the accelerator. And this is a picture of, um, of one of the detectors, the CMS detector, compact muon solenoid. It's uh, in a cavern 40 meters by 40 meters, also 100 meters underground. And this is where we make the proton beams collide. Uh, the, this detector and the others as well act like gigantic cameras where we take uh, something like 40 million uh, pictures a second. And the result of this is a large amount of data that we need to store and analyze. Um, we, we collect and, and store more than 70 petabytes of data every year. And this is after um, a lot of filtering. Uh, one, of, uh, one detector like this can generate something like one petabyte of data per second. Uh, so that's why we are constantly looking to new technologies that can help us uh, handle this amount of data. Um, so the main motivation for our service is the expanded usage of machine learning in high energy physics. Uh, different groups at CERN work on various machine learning projects in order to achieve scientific goals of the Large Hadron Collider. And we know that setting uh, up and managing machine learning infrastructure is not an easy task. And currently, uh, most groups at CERN manage their own machine learning infrastructure. So we have four main experiments, which all branch to different groups. And uh, that means that a lot of people use their own machine learning infrastructure. Uh, we want to offer a centralized place, uh, a centralized service, in order to reduce physicists' efforts in infrastructure and to allow more time for scientific research. Uh, one of the main uh, applications of machine learning at CERN is in particle reconstruction. So during proton-proton collisions, short-lived particles are created in the detectors. For example, Higgs boson, which lives uh, um, 10 to the minus 22 uh, seconds, and to capture the events of uh, sh the short-lived particles, we measure energy depositions in the detectors. Uh, detectors can be considered as 3D cameras, which uh, leaves the opportunity to use convolutional neural networks. Uh, besides convolutional neural networks, uh, we can use uh, graph neural networks, which are also very good at spatial uh, representation. So uh, the example would be uh, to take the output of the detector, uh, and let that be an input to a network. And the output of the network would be the ID of the particle, whether it's a Higgs boson or a muon or a pion, for example. And now lots of uh, research is going towards graph neural networks. Uh, another uh, application is in detector simulations. So a large hadron collider is getting upgraded. Uh, there will be more, even more data in the future and more sophisticated and faster solutions are needed to support the upgrade from various perspectives, one of them being simulations. So uh, simulations are performed to, so that we can ac accurately uh, estimate uh, what is going to happen during the runs. Uh, and uh, the traditional methods are Monte Carlo simulations, 
but recently 3D uh, guns have started to be more commonly used and they have proved to have a similar performance to state-of-the-art Monte Carlo and they offer 20,000 times faster simulation. And also with 3D gun, uh, data can be simulated on the fly, which may reduce the need for storing the data. So our goal is to set up a platform to support uh, the end-to-end -end, uh, machine learning life cycles. Uh, we want to be able to extract data from the detectors through Spark or HDFS and operate on that data. Then we want fast iteration services, such as notebooks, because many users use uh, notebooks daily. At least they, uh, notebooks are a good starting point for every machine learning user. Then for more computationally extensive jobs, we want to be able to perform distributed training with uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch. And uh, even we want to branch, branch out to public cloud when resources are needed. So then after the training, uh, we want to store our models and to be able to perform scalable serving for, uh, for the trained models. Cool. So uh, the platform that supports all of our goals is Kubeflow. Uh, basically with Kubeflow, we are utilizing power of Kubernetes to efficiently manage uh, resources. And we also uh, offer users the, all the desired features. Uh, the infrastructure part of Kubeflow is managed by our cloud team and our users are physicists and scientists across the entire CERN. Uh, with Kubeflow, we can offer notebooks, pipelines, distributed training, model serving, and we can also offer bursting to public cloud when necessary. And that means that basically all of our use cases are covered by Kubeflow. And Ricardo will now discuss our setup and challenges in terms of uh, setting up our Kubeflow instance. Yeah, so I'll, I'll pick up on the nice description from Dan and uh, before he does a cool demo, I'll just uh, talk about uh, the layout of the infrastructure we are using. So this is a very simplified overview of the clusters, uh, the layout of our clusters. So we rely on a, an entry point load balancer and this allows us to, to simplify the deployment and for example, to do upgrades by just uh, adding entry points to the load balancer, new clusters on the back end. And then there's a gateway that is our ingress gateway to, to the services. Uh, the main important bit here is that we have three types of um, uh, nodes. Uh, the first type is virtual GPUs. Uh, this is uh, something that allows us to have a large amount of GPU resources, although they are not as performance uh, as having a full GPU, but it allows us to have a much larger amount of resources for things like notebooks, for example. And we rely on T4s with time sharing in this case. Uh, then we have the PC PCI pass-through uh, node group type. Uh, and here we it's mostly used for things like pipelines or, or um, uh, distributed training, hyperparameter optimization, and also model serving, where you, you want to guarantee a certain latency for the, for the model serving. Uh, we do not do, do today any kind of uh, faster interconnect or interlink or anything like this. And the last bit we have here is CPU. And in this case, we have a much larger amount of resources. Uh, it's not as interesting if you're doing deep learning, but actually this platform ended up being used for other purposes as well, where workflows and pipelines can be useful. So you can see that uh, we have something on the order of hundreds of virtual GPUs or the tens of uh, full um, GPUs offered to the users and there are thousands of uh, CPUs. Um, just very quickly, uh, our deployment is based on a Kubernetes 118 clusters today. We use Kubeflow 1.1 still. And one difference from the standard 1.1 deployment is that we upgraded Istio to 1.5 and Knative to 0.15. All the clusters and the deployments are managed using a uh, uh, GitOps, and we have a uh, one repository where, where we define all the services and all the environments we support, and it's all managed by Argo CD. Uh, there is one very good uh, feature here, which is uh, Argo CD allows us to use uh, customize just for the Kubeflow deployment, and then for the other co components, uh, we rely on the operators for both Istio and NVIDIA GPU operator deployments. And then for Prometheus K native cert manager, we are relying on Helm charts, upstream Helm charts. Um, we, one of the key aspects is the integrations we do with the internal CERN services. So the first one is identity, authorization, and authentication. And we link this to the CERN SSO. 
we use, uh, which is based on um, Keycloak. Uh, so this allows us to have not only the tokens that identify the user, but also the mapping of the users to the roles and the groups they belong to. And what we do in our clusters is we, we have dedicated namespaces per user where people have a default quota that is fixed and cannot be changed. But also we have additional groups uh, where people can belong to, and this is defined in the CERN identity if they belong to these groups. And in those groups, they can request additional quota like more GPUs, for example. Um, and then the other very important part is the integration with our storage systems. As we, we mentioned, like data is a key aspect of uh, everything we do. Uh, so we integrate with three, the three main uh, uh, storage systems that are interesting in this case. The first one is uh, we call CVMFS, CERN VMFS, which is a read-only distributed hierarchical caching system for, that is mostly used for software distribution. The second one is uh, an internal in-house uh, developed system called EOS that is uh, holding all the physics data. In this case, the important part is that we need to, uh, we offer both Kerberos and OAuth 2 based access. OAuth 2 is very important for things like notebooks and anything that is uh, uh, like browser oriented. And then the last one is HDFS. Um, Dayan mentioned that in some cases, people want to do the data preparation using Spark. And in this case, we are accessing HDFS using Kerberos credentials. I will just summarize a couple of issues that we uh, run while, uh, into while doing this. Uh, the first one is that uh, the Kubeflow releases were not always very consistent in terms of what's supporting what. So 1.0 had, for example, multi-user support for, for notebooks, but uh, not uh, uh, pipelines and one one brought multi-user pipelines, but actually some of the components were not talking to to this new API properly, like Kale from notebooks. This meant that we spent quite a bit of time downstream uh, uh, fixing these bits when we did the upgrade, and this is one of the reasons why we are still in one one and we are slowly uh, updating to newer versions as well. The second one is actually customize, and the way uh, Kubeflow is using customize is quite complex. Uh, so we decided to spend some time simplifying things and removing uh, some of the components out of it, especially things like cert manager, Istio and Knative, which are quite critical. Um, and in the end, we deploy them uh, in another way and we only deploy the Kubeflow applications using Customize. And then the last one, which is still an ongoing uh, issue is how to manage additional packages that people might require for both the notebooks and then, then for their pipelines as well. Uh, and how can they install and add these packages easily to their containers? So this is something I will mention more uh, later. The last bit I will mention before we jump to the demo is uh, how we are doing uh, bursting to the public clouds. Um, this is very important for us because uh, we can get access to a much larger amount of GPUs and especially other types of accelerators like TPUs or IPUs. TPUs are very interesting for our use cases um, also because they're very cost effective. Um, we tried this um, using different technologies over the last few years uh, on the lower level. We tried Federation V1 and V2. We, we also have deployments using the virtual kubelet. We are not still very um, experts in Istio, but we are experimenting with it. But actually for Kubeflow, the um, most promising results and the way we are offering this is actually to directly expose the other clusters to the to the users via their Jupyter environment. So when you get your Jupyter environment, uh, your notebook environment, you actually get uh, the additional clusters configured. And these clusters are configured with the same CERN SSO. So we can do uh, something like using the open policy agent to validate who is able to access which, which clusters, which groups can actually access each cluster. And then we do the quota management the same way in those clusters as well. So this is working quite well. This is a, a Simple, not so simple picture, but it's kind of simple given what, what is behind. But the key aspect is that this Jupyter environment, <clears throat> we have the cluster configuration and we are able to reuse the OWASP to token that the user already have, has by logging into the system at CERN. And then, but normally they would just submit to the same uh, cluster where uh, Kubeflow is running. The, the Jupyter environment, and they would submit a TF job that would use GPUs on premises. And then when once this training is done, we, we write the out, uh, output artifacts to S3, where it can be served from the S3 instance at CERN. 
by exposing additional clusters in the environment, people can just source those clusters um, and then submit the, the TF jobs to external clusters. And this, in this case, it would be good, the Google Cloud where we would have potentially thousands of GPUs available or GPUs. In the end, again, the output artifacts as we are written to S3 and served in the same way as if they would have been trained internally. So this is a, a quite promising and this is what we are offering today. Okay, now we'll go back to our uh, demo uh, example. So we remember 3D guns. Uh, basically, uh, the, the main issue with 3D guns is um, uh, extensive training time. So uh, for our model, uh, it would take two, 2.5 days to, to properly train. And if, for example, if we want to uh, search hyperparameters or change the model, that iteration could last for weeks or even months. So this is uh, with one GPU. So um, to um, create a more scalable solution, um, a distributed uh, model is created. Basically, um, it's, um, the model is trained using TensorFlow strategies. So uh, for example, we are using in our um, example, a multi-worker mirror strategy, with, which uses different nodes with multiple G, uh, GPUs. And also we have a script with uh, accessing TPUs for the distributed training. Uh, so uh, TF job and kubeflow help us um, automate this distributed training process. Uh, we are able to uh, quickly iterate over different uh, training configurations. So basically we are encapsulating TensorFlow distribution and uh, we man it's, it's managing it across Kubernetes pods. Uh, so uh, we are able with TF job to run distributed training both locally and on a public cloud as Ricardo was describing. And uh, yeah, we uh, at uh, GCP, we are uh, using 128 uh, preemptible uh, uh, machines for the distributed training. And now we can uh, move to the demo. Uh, so uh, let me share the screen. So now we are going to show our demo. Here we can see at ml.cern.ch our service uh, dashboard. Basically, this is the Kubeflow dashboard and we can uh, check all the uh, Kubeflow uh, features. So now we're going to show our demo. Uh, we can see our dashboard here and we can see uh, Kubeflow features on the left. We have pipelines, notebook servers, Katib, and the other features. So uh, we'll go to our notebook, which is basically where we have our demo prepared. So uh, here we have a couple of demos we are going to show. Uh, the first one is um, one from the from our um, examples repo. Basically, we created a, a repository for onboarding our users for various Kubeflow features. We are going to show Kale. Uh, this uh, this example shows us how to convert uh, a notebook to a pipeline without writing any additional Python code. So for that, we are using Kale deployment panel. And basically the only thing we need to do is to annotate every, every cell so that it converts uh, properly to a pipeline component. In addition to annotating, we are creating connections between uh, pipeline components and we can also add the GPU to any specific pipeline component. So here we can, uh, in order to uh, run, we only need to click this button compile and run and we can see our pipeline uh, running. So while our pipeline is running, we can check other uh, features which we have uh, in our service. Uh, one of them is EOS. So EOS uh, is where uh, most users, where all users at CERN have their uh, personal directories and uh, uh, mounting EOS uh, really allows us to be able to uh, access uh, 
broad uh, uh, data from uh, multiple users. Basically, every user can access their own personal uh, folder here. And also, we can show uh, the usage of a uh, GPU with NVIDIA SMI. So, yeah, uh, we are uh, starting with uh, that. Uh, the main example which we have is uh, 3D GAN. So here uh, we have our 3D GAN training. So uh, we have uh, different scripts here. Uh, one of them is training uh, 3D GAN with the CPU, and then uh, we train uh, 3D GAN with the GPU here. And it's all distributed training when it comes to GPUs. So basically here, what we want to check is uh, uh, strategy. So we see that uh, we see that uh, we are using multi-worker mirrored strategy for GPU training. And also, uh, as Ardo was mentioning, we are also uploading the trained model to a bucket. And we see that code here that after the model is trained, we are uh, uploading it to our CERN uh, bucket. Similarly for TPUs, uh, only here we have a TPU strategy for distributed training. Uh, we also, in this repository, have a Docker file to be, build our image to, to run uh, our dis distributed training, but we are not building it uh, here. We won't do that, but we'll show our TF job uh, YAML file. So to submit a TF job, basically we can define our number of replicas here, uh, number of GPUs we are using here, and then we also uh, we select the image, and we also can select if we want to, uh, full training and the number of epochs and other customizable uh, arguments. So now we are going to submit our uh, our three um, D three uh, D gun TF job uh, on a local cluster. All we have to do is to do kubectl apply. GPU. So yeah, this one uh, we are submitting to our local cluster. And we can check our uh, TF job. And we see our TF job running. So um, now might be a good time to check if our pipeline uh, has completed. It has. So we can see our logs and we can see that our pipeline has completely uh, has completed training two models and we see which model was better uh, and now we're running the distributed training of a 3d gun on a local cluster uh, additionally we want to run a, a 3d gun uh, training on a google cluster so uh, basically uh, inside the cluster folder uh, users would get uh, um, information about all available clusters uh, in our service. So here we only have a CERN and the GCP cluster. And uh, uh, all the users have to do to uh, access the additional clusters is to source uh, these files. So um, GCP setup, setup.sh, and now they should be able to uh, they should they are in uh, the google uh, cloud cluster so as we can see in the google cloud cluster there are no pods in my personal namespace but in uh, uh, this local cluster we have our uh, i have a couple of pods here running and uh, some of them completed so um, what we are going to submit here are uh, 3D gun example. So we can go to um, to our uh, GCP uh, our GCP YAML file, and we are going to submit that. GCP. So. Um, now we are submitting this TF job to a Google Google cluster. Um, meanwhile, uh, we can check if uh, our uh, training on our local cluster has completed. So 
flow. And yes, we can see that it uh, has completed. And to check the Google cluster, uh, basically we want to have a watch. And yes, uh, we can see here that uh, our workers are uh, deployed at nodes which have uh, v V100s. So in total, we have 128 nodes running and uh, we have uh, uh, 16 workers where each worker has eight uh, nodes. So now our training job is running actually on a Google uh, cluster. And this is what we see here. So we can close this now. And uh, here we see that our local job has completed. And now, as Ricardo was saying, uh, after uh, the training, we submit uh, our model to a bucket. So here we can see uh, uh, the, the trained model stored on, on our buckets. So we have a couple of files for each model, and then this is all for, for one model and for one epoch. So we have our discriminator and generator for 3D gun stored in the bucket. And we also have a saved model in the format uh, so that it can be used for uh, inference for serving. And also we want to uh, maybe want to check this, uh, these metrics. Basically, this is how we can store uh, metrics, how we store metrics about our model uh, after each epoch. So, okay, now we have uh, covered the 3D gun. Uh, the last thing uh, I would like to cover is the inference uh, is the inference or the inference services. Services. What we want to do here is to submit uh, an inference service and uh, to basically serve a model by only specifying where the model is located. So we can say kubectl apply. And now we have created our uh, inference service. Actually, it was already it was already there, but this is how we can we create it when we when we want. Uh, and then uh, to test our inference we can test it from here. And we see that we are getting the results. And basically, as we were discussing, we're getting a 3D output uh, for uh, that represents the output of the detector. So this is what happens when we do uh, one inference. But uh, we want to do 10 uh, curl re requests at the same time so that we can see what happens to the number of predictor pods. As we can see, they are uh, uh, the number of pods is increasing. It's auto scaling, so that it can support uh, uh, client requests. And basically, uh, yeah, with this we have covered our demo. So basically, during this training, we were able to. Um, reduce the execution time from one hour to 30 seconds for one epoch. And for the full training, we managed to get from uh, um, 60 hours to around 30 minutes. So uh, TF job really helped us uh, speed up the development process. And we see that we get almost linear improvement in our performance for our 3D gun model. And now Ricardo will offer the closing remarks. Yeah. So. Basically, I hope this was a, a nice overview of uh, the service we are offering and the potential that it has by offering a, like a consistent environment where people can do their development, but also interact with the services. Um, we handle all the machine life, life, learning lifecycle steps from preparation all the way to serving. Um, we managed to centralize the resources uh, that are pretty scarce, uh, such as accelerators in this case, GPUs. And also we showed how we are doing currently the integration with external uh, resources for GPUs, DPUs using public clouds. Uh, there are uh, steps we are still working on. So one of the main ones is to onboard new use cases. And from those, there's a very interesting one for reinforcement learning uh, for, from the people doing the beam calibration where they want to um, 
like keep the model live and, and uh, update it live uh, while the beam is running. Uh, the second uh, second thing I would like to mention is uh, this uh, need to be able, for users to be able to curate their own environments and to add uh, packages to to their own environments easily. Uh, right now, the only option is to install the packages on the notebook, but that doesn't work well when you're doing a transition to pipelines, for example, or to distribute training. So we have some experience using a tool called Binder for uh, Jupyter Notebooks, and uh, we are looking at integrating this with the Kuplo Jupyter web app as well. Uh, and the last one is uh, we are quite involved in the work, ongoing work uh, for Kuplo improvements in metadata and artifact management. So it's something that we'll also uh, keep pushing for in the community. So we would like to thank uh, like everyone in the Kuplo community for, for the great tooling that, and of course, all the Kubernetes and cloud native tools that we rely on as well. And we are happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.